Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. Today we're looking at the very spooky Shedinja archetype from Unified Minds, and let's jump straight into the basic concept. And that is that Shedinja's ability is so nuts post-rotation. Now we have a lot less gusting available in the format, there is just custom catchers for the majority of decks. Some don't even play gusting at all, and there's also a handful of decks that will play Ninetales, that's the scariest one in the Shedinja's uh, point of view. And also, tool removal is far worse. There's no more field blower. It is only a handful of decks, once again, that choose to play Lysander Labs. Uh, sometimes people are teching it in to things like Bacephalon. Sometimes they're in Picaroms. Uh, that's probably the most likely one where you'll end up seeing Labs. And a handful of other decks might try and incorporate it into the list. Uh, but not many of them. And very few decks that I've seen at all are playing Faber. So basically, tool removal is no longer a thing. That means Shedinja is on such a high power level that if you can get into this loop you're going to be laughing because it really is just so insane and your opponent just has less answers to this. You have six lifelines of prizes. Uh, well, you have five lifelines until you lose the game, basically. So you can spend uh, the good few opening turns building towards your board state and then just letting the Shedinja take over and end up basically trying to deck the opponent out. That is the main way that you try and win this uh, with this deck. Usually you'll actually end up taking the six prizes beforehand because you like run them out of energy or just make them start passing into you um, one way or another. And then you can just load up an Oranga and start hitting for 60 a turn or use the Mew to attack all the time, stuff like that. Uh, that's normally how the game like closes once you've finally stopped them from attacking into you. Um, but overall you are running the oppon opponent out of resources just by looping Shedinja uh, while they attack into you and take no prizes. That's the whole idea. Let's jump into the Pokemon lines. 4-4 four, four, Shedinja is a must. We want to try and find Ninkadas early. And that Vessel of Life Shedinja is literally the entire basis of the deck. Um, he's really a fantastic ability. Uh, you can promote your Ninkada for turn every uh, time something's knocked out. And then evolve into Shedinja to essentially be a free retreater. Um, freeing up bench space, which is really nice. Um, so you don't have to have like two Orangaroos down every single time. You can just fill your board with Zebras, have one Ninkada in the back, one Shedinja on your attacking Pokemon for turn, and it works really fluidly. Uh, we have 4-4 four, four of Zeb Striker. We're playing 60 hit point Blitzels, which is a must because we are playing Elms. Um, and these, again, are of core a central part of the deck. You try and have two, maybe three Zeb Striker in play at any one time so that you can sprint away your hand a bunch of times, trying to recycle things like Brock's Grit, Lieutenant Surge's strategy, and uh, things like Mars and other supporters like that. Um, so sprinting is essential. Aranguru as well, an essential cog in the machine of this deck. Uh, resource management, getting you back. Pal pad, other supporter cards, uh, energy cards, all sorts of things. Getting back your one-off crushing hammer is oftentimes a really important thing to cycle uh, because it's one of the ways that you can run your opponent out of stuff. Uh, also, things like Mars is the other way that we can actively try and take cards out of our opponent's deck alongside the 1-1 one -one Persian line that you're seeing here. Again, we've got to play a 60 hit point Meowth, something to bear in mind. It can also draw us cards, which is nice. Um, Persian has the make and pay attack, which can uh, take a look at your opponent's hand and then put them down to four cards. This can be really nice for getting rid of things that would be scary for you. Uh, things like reset stamps, things like uh, custom catchers, any Lysander labs that they for some reason haven't put into play. If they're saving them for attacks. Energy cards, get rid of those and get rid of their shuffle draw effects. Get rid of their Cynthia's and their Judges and Titan Lizers and all that stuff because it extends the game longer. It gives them a chance to tie the game because you really do have to play quickly with this deck um, to try and win within 60 minutes. That's genuinely a concern for this archetype. Um, so using Make and Pay can definitely accelerate that win condition and also remove things like shuffle effects to make the opponent have to scoop earlier, which is pretty good for you. So this Persian, a really nice card. It safeguards you against them trying to build towards some combo pieces. Uh, I think Make and Pay Persian is far stronger than Slow King now in Unified Minds format because um, it's way more difficult for your opponent to keep like a below four card hand size now that Ultra Ball's gone and they could like hold on to just one Guzma, whereas now they have to try and assemble custom catcher combo pieces. So the Persian is much more likely to hit big targets, which is pretty awesome. From there, we have Ditto Prism. It's another way to be a Meowth, as well as, you know, an extra Blitzel or Ninkada, so it's a no-brainer. And one copy of Mew. Bench Barrier is phenomenal, so that we can um, defend against Pikachu and Zekrom's Tag Bolt. Um, there's nothing scarier than them custom capturing up a Zev Striker and knocking out two in one go. That is horrible for you, so having the Mew is pretty nice. And once again, uh, Psy Power can actually end up being like your late game sort of attack that you use to try and put pressure on the opponent once they've run out of energy cards. So um, it can do some damage, so bear that in mind. 
Next up uh, onto the trainers, uh, we have one copy of Palpad. It's a really nice thing to recycle in this deck because um, it effectively gets you two supporters that you can then sprint into the Palpad and then play the Palpad and then sprint again and then get those supporters that you instantly want, which is nice. Um, obviously very good alongside Lieutenant Surge's strategy, so you can surge, Palpad, sprint, and then get into those two things that you've just um, Palpadded back and play both of them. So a lot of the time the Palpad will be something like a Mars and a Brock, or maybe a Brock and a Surge for the following turn, something like that. Um, Crushing Hammer is a really nice card to actively put pressure on the opponent. It's just a one-off copy, um, but we can loop it with a Rangaroo, which is really nice. Uh, we're trying to max out the consistency cards. I didn't have space for the fourth Pokenav, so we are just playing three. Uh, but it helps you look at the top three cards, uh, reveal a Pokemon or energy you find there, and put it into your hand. It's not a very big dig, uh, but we are playing 27 energies and Pokemon combined. Uh, so that's almost half the deck. So Pokenav has pretty reasonable odds of hitting most times, especially in the early game, which is where it's most important. Uh, and also has some minor synergy of rearranging top decks, which can be nice for the likes of Acrobike. Um, or knowing that you're going to sprint and having information before that, which is pretty cool. Um, so the Pokenav uh, is pretty nice. I think these other ones that are maxed out of four copies, the Com, the Acrobike, and the Gear are more valuable. That's why Nav is just at three. Um, Poke Gear really important for helping you get Elms turn one, as well as digging towards things like Hapu, um, which is like our kind of turn two, three, four supporter while we are thinning the deck as quickly as possible. Um, with Hapu and Sprint, this deck gets thin very, very quickly, and that is the objective of this archetype. Get to a low deck uh, so that you can effectively loop your um, discard pile and your deck with resource management and Brock and whatnot. That's the aim of the game. So Poke Gear, good for just early game safeguarding. Acrobike, just for normal digging potential, and Com giving you better outs towards Ninkadas and Blitzels on turn one, and then helping you find Zeb Strikers and stuff on that second turn, which is pretty big. We're playing one stadium, which is Champions Festival. Um, Champions Festival is obviously still in format, and I imagine we'll be getting one for Worlds anyway if you want to play the new one, so don't stress about buying one. Um, but uh, yeah, it um, heals your entire board when your bench is full, and um, that's really nice against some Malamar-style players because some people are going to try and use Mew to slowly like Psy power things, um, and Giratina can Distortion Door a few times and keep knocking itself out and then gets Ultra Necrozma in range for like spreading against you. Um, so the Champions Festival just negates that completely and makes the Malamar matchups like super easy. Um, so Champions Festival is the one-off stadium of choice for me right now. Um, just a safeguard against Ultra Necrozma, but uh, there's definitely potential for other stadiums to come into the deck if you're not worried about that matchup. Onto the supporters, uh, we have three one-offs, two two-offs, and four four-offs. So I guess I'll actually start with the four-offs. Elm, uh, obvious turn one card, which is phenomenal, and also can get your Shedinjas, because they have only 40 hit points. Um, so they're Elm targets as well. So it's a phenomenal card in the opening turn, and sometimes on like two or three as well. Hapu, again, turn two, three, four. This supporter is essential. It gives you a six card dig, it dumps all of these other supporters that you don't need until you're in your loop, whilst also helping you pick out, you know, the Zeb Strikers. That's pretty much the main thing Hapu's looking for the whole time. Sometimes it's getting you Shedinjas, sometimes it's getting you, um, like, Recycle Energy or Monkey or something like that, but um, usually Hapu is just digging for Zeb Strikers, which helps you dig even further. Then we have two copies of Lieutenant Surge's Strategy and Brock's Grit. Now that Gladian has gone, uh, I definitely don't feel comfortable playing these at one counts because this deck can lose to bad prizes. Uh, so you've got to play two copies of these. Um, you just want one of them to be in your deck every game, basically, um, so that you can loop them. Uh, Lieutenant Surge's Strategy is a really awesome supporter to use in this deck uh, because it helps us do things like Surge Mars Brock in the same turn, which is a pretty big deal, or Surge Faber. Um, Brock, stuff like that is a pretty big deal as well. So um, these are really nice things to try and spam. And your opponent usually will take a prize card whilst you're building towards your initial Shedinjas and whatnot. And that means we can punish the opponent uh, by using Lieutenant Soda's strategy. And um, Brock's Grit is, again, a core piece. It helps us recycle these Shedinjas for the most part. Also can reload our energies and our Rangaroos if we really need to. We do have Recycle Energy now in the deck, so it's less likely that you're going for basic energy cards. But at the same time, oftentimes Recycle Energy goes to your hand. If you don't already have another Rangaroo in your hand or on the bench, um, you then have to sprint away that Recycle Energy. So although Recycle Energy is nice and reusable, Oftentimes it still gets sprinted away, so Brock's gritting back basic energies is still pretty important. So ju don't just play uh, special energies in this deck, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, Brock is usually just getting the Shedinjas and whatnot. 
onto the one-offs. Um, they are important cards, but you can still win games if they're prized. That's why they're only at one counts. Uh, Faber can be an extra way to contest the stadium wall, uh, which is really important. And most importantly, it lost zones them. So even if your opponent is playing like labs and their own Oranguru, um, you can start loss zoning those labs so they can't recycle them, which is a pretty big deal. So I think with the Faber and the one off Stadium, we're relatively safeguarded against losing to um, Lysander Labs. It's kind of sketchy in those opening turns. If your opponent is finding labs very quickly, it gets very scary because um, if it happens like mid to late game, you never care because you can just um, resource management back in your Faber or your um, Stadium and just sprint and get back into it to counter Stadium turn by turn. But it's those opening like two or three turns. If they are hitting labs early and you haven't got to the point where you can recycle these cards, it does get scary. So I can definitely see you trying to wiggle in a space for a second stadium. Um, but for now, I'm just playing one copy of the Faber and one copy of a stadium card to deny Lysander labs. But that's the main reason you can end up getting things like special energy cards. And it's also a mirror tech as well, because <laughs> you can start lost zoning their Shedinjas, so bear that in mind. Um, Mars is actively milling whilst drawing a couple of cards, which is nice. Um, so this is one way that we can start making our opponent play cards and make them do things, knowing that they have a chance of us just getting rid of a card here or there. So it sort of forces the opponent to play and that helps us mill them more often. And the Titan Liza is a safeguard around your opponent just trying to trap things. If they have any corner style attacks or anything like that, we can get around it with Titan Liza, which otherwise we wouldn't be able to do. So yeah, onto the energies. Uh, two recycle energy. And it's a really nice card in this deck when your Orangaroos are continuously just just getting knocked out and as long as you can have access to your next Oranguru, um, you can just instantly replay this recycle energy it also means that like retreating out of Ninkadas or Blitzels or whatever on those opening turns just to put a, an Oranguru up front because you never want your Blitzels or Ninkadas to get knocked out in those opening turns because they really want to evolve um, you can just pivot into something else and regain that recycle energy for the following turn as well so it's a really nice addition that we get from the new set and we're playing two copies of fire energy um, we could play any energy uh, it doesn't affect any of our attacks um, we don't have access to Headbolt, but we wouldn't ever want to. Um, and we use the Fire Energies because there are um, big ovens being played and there's Heat Factory being played. And we could take advantage of both of those stadium cards. So there's no reason not to play Fires. It's easily the best energy that we can take advantage of. Here is the full list. I'll put it uh, down below in the description as always. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty happy with where I've got to with the build. There are definitely room for techs and different avenues for this archetype. Um, I thought about going towards netball and a uh, basic grass energy. Netball giving you better access to Ninkadas, but overall I think just having high poker gear and high elm is usually the best thing. It's actually more, much more important for us to find Blitzel's turn one than it is to find Ninkadas. Now there's so few amounts of gusting in decks. Like you don't care if your opponent takes like three prizes while you're getting set up. Um, you can end up denying them still from there. Like so, it's not important to find an Ninkadas first. It's way, way, way more important to find the Blitzels. Um, so Netball doesn't really outvalue any of the other cards that we're playing right now. <coughs> For more of these things where you put your opponent on a clock, you could think about adding in a Shrine of Punishment as one copy of a stadium, um, just so that your win condition is accelerated via damage rather than actually running your opponent out of physical cards, because that takes ages. That really does take a long time. You have to play very quickly with Shedinja and not make mistakes. So it really does require 15 minutes of a lot of focus Whereas a Shrine of Punishment makes it a lot easier for you. If they have benched enough GXs where you can win by damage, your goal is simply whenever I can resource management back a Shrine, I will. I'll get it back into play and I'll slowly tick my opponent to death um, with these damage counters. So if you want to have an easy mode build, um, you can change the Champions Festival for a Shrine or you could make a space for a second stadium, which would be a Shrine. I don't think you have any two Champs Festivals. You would play one and one and then one Faber. Um, so if you want to have the fastest means of winning possible in this archetype, it would be with Shrine and Punishment. Similar In a similar vein to that, you have Koga's Trap. It forces Poison, so that again starts ticking over damage counters, and it's not only for GXs, which is something to bear in mind, and at the same time, it confuses the opponent, so it can stop your opponent simply just announcing attacks with one thing that they've powered up over and over again. Uh, it forces them to play switching cards, it forces them to attach energy to other things, and again, this is playing cards out of their hand for you, uh, so the Koga's Trap could force that 
space is my biggest issue. Uh, I really want to find space for a shrine, to be honest. Um, I think it safeguards you a little bit more against labs, and it does that easy mode of trying to damage the opponent. Um, but it would end up having to cut like another poker nav or something like that, which you definitely can do. But it hurts, you know, when you do just have brick hands with this deck. Um, it sucks when you're just looking at a shrine like, oh man, this could be a poker nav and get me out of this bad situation. So. If you want to have these more active, damaging uh, cards, you could definitely put them in the list. And then there's another way that you can try and actively mill the opponent, and that's with Giovanni's Exile with Diglett combo for underground work. We've seen this with uh, Pedro's uh, most recent builds of the deck um, pre, well, for the uh, for the EYC, I think it was. Um, and that's def definitely something that you could consider. Also, playing a Giovanni's Exile could open the door for you to play Dedenne GX. Uh, that gives you great options of Pokecom to just draw more cards in those opening turns. It's similar in many ways to like a Poke Gear, uh, where you like get a fresh six to look for Elm in those opening turns, which is pretty nice. Um, it obviously has discard synergy, so you thin the deck quicker um, and draw a bunch of cards. And you can use the Giovanni's Exile at some point in the game to remove this two prize liability, uh, which is definitely something to bear in mind. If you don't believe in the Giovanni's Exile, but do want to try out Dedenne, you could also try a super scoop up, literally one copy and one Dedenne can go in the list. I've seen it in previous builds with Lele um, because you will eventually, with enough coin flips uh, being recycled, pick up that Dedenne and uh, get it off your bench uh, because Dedenne taking up a bench space isn't that ideal. So if you do want to play Dedenne GX, you have to play either Giovanni's or Super Scoop Up, but one of them will definitely suffice. Onto the matchup overview, really there's not many that are too bad. Um, Mewtwo Welder could be bad if they play a Macargo GX that they tech to mill five cards, and that would be very ugly. Uh, Picarom typically is playing uh, four customs, typically playing two um, Lysander Labs, and they also have the GX attack available. So Picarom is the one where you actually have to draw really well to win the game. Uh, you need to find Mew in a sufficient amount of time. Oftentimes it's like turn three where they're threatening Tag Bolt these days, like realistically. Um, like at the latest so you've got to find your Mew you've got to already have like Shedinja attached to a bunch of things um, you probably want to try and protect your Zeb Strikes at the same time by having like three down so they don't just custom and kill two at the same time um, so Picaron definitely like forces the most out of the player and I think oftentimes that will end up being an awkward matchup. You'll never get to that point of stability uh, unless you end up Persianing some good targets away or if they prize some targets or whatever. So I think Picaron, you expect to not win a lot of the time unless um, you draw pretty well. Dark Box is technically a bad matchup. Um, you can't crushing hammer them away because they'll always play Naggers. And that means that they can eventually get to 10 energies and they can use Sable Tar to win the game against you, which is obviously a bad matchup. And Aerodactyl is also one I would not expect to do too well against. They obviously have that annoying ability, which means it's less easy for us to chain um, resource management. Um, and that means that we can't get into our loop as effectively. And that makes life difficult for us. And to boot, uh, the main way I've been playing Aerodactyl at least is with Fire Crystals and Nine Tails as well. So they will also have a bunch of gusting options. Quick note on Reshizard and Clowns. If they are both playing Nine Tails, uh, they can also become additional awkward matchups. So I think Fire Decks playing Nine Tails are far scarier than Fire Decks playing Custom Catchers. But I think typically um, Reshizard is green based. I think that's my favorite way to play Reshizard. And that, that means they'll play Customs. And for Blounds, I, it, it's kind of a split. I think there's a handful of people playing like heavy Pokecom and then they're playing Persian and Nine Tails. Tails, and then there's the camp that I'm currently sitting in, which is Custom Catchers plus Thick Naga plus Naga GX. Um, admittedly, you have a better time against Shedinja if you play the Nine Tails, um, but at the same time, they can Persian those things out of your hand. Uh, they can also just you know Persian like fire energies out of your hand, and that still gets rough. So um, I think Nine Tails doesn't like simply auto win this deck, but it definitely like poses a big threat. So I haven't ended up putting them as like bad matchups on this overview here, but technically they could get worse if they are playing Nine Tails. So something to bear in mind. Onto the closing thoughts. This deck hates to lose Gladian, man. Uh, having to play two copies of Brock and Surge is ugly. It eats into your spaces. Like, those would, right there would straight away just be spaces for uh, other cards you'd like. I'm playing four energy cards so that even if you prize one, you can still attack um, with Profound Knowledge with your Oranguru, which is, like, your best pressure attack once they've run out of energy cards. And these are all, like, luxury spaces that otherwise you could cut corners with this list and only have three energy and only have one copy of all these things, knowing that you had two Gladian in the deck uh, to always, like, gain access to them whenever you wanted to. Um, so Gladian really is awkward and if you have bad enough prizes you could just end up having to scoop the game like if you prize two Orangaroos if you pry 
prize um, like Faber plus Stadium if you prize um, a handful of other things like Double Brock or Double Surge oftentimes is just really bad for you. Even if you just prize things like the one Mars, like you don't lose the game, but it slows down your win condition so much that you may not win in 60 minutes. So it really sucks that you don't have Gladian in this deck anymore. It really is a big pain. Um, one thing I will say, though, is that many decks, even if they are thinking they have techs, like, just because you're playing two Lysander Labs doesn't mean you just straight up win Shedinja. That's, like, not the case. It's specifically the, the case in Picron because they also have Sniping and they also have Gust and they're playing the Labs. So that's what accumulates them to have, like, a good uh, time against you um, because they have all of those things in one deck. Whereas if you're just trying to shove two Labs into anything, you're not going to do well. Like, you're still probably not going to beat Shedinja, so... It feels like you either go all in and tech for it heavily um, by going with like a Ranguru plus Gusting plus a Stadium or something like that, or you just don't bother because they can still just Persian Mars things out of your hand and um, they can hit like a number of your custom catches. They can hit Stadium and stuff like that. And it just means that you end up losing the game. So I think uh, you really have to heavily tech for Shedinja if you really want to. The one final note I will say though is that from what I've tested with the deck so far, it's really difficult to play. You have to play fast. And, like, many people, when they practice, like, an archetype, they won't do it under time conditions. But if you actually test under time conditions with this deck, it becomes a whole new challenge. Because you have to be there during your opponent's turn, sorting out your discard pile, knowing exactly, like, what you're going to sprint resource management for the following turn. And that is difficult to do, especially when the new reset stamp comes into the mix for making life difficult for you. Previously, this deck could simply sprint, sprint, sprint down to literally zero cards and then just resource management and be happy that they haven't decked out. But now that there's a reset stamp, you always have to have a total number of seven cards in uh, your hand and deck. Um, and that makes life difficult for you. Um, sometimes you'll end up brocking, sprinting, missing what you want off of the first sprint and not being able to second sprint um, because you missed the thing you wanted. Um, for example, if you brock back in like two Ninkardas and they're the bottom cards that you have in your deck, you then can't sprint again, bench Ninkarda and resource management because you will then lose to reset stamp. So um, that just makes room for more mistakes over the course of the game and mistakes and like it brings more RNG into the deck as well because you simply can't guarantee the loop for the fo following turn. You have high chances because you're brocking like six cards and it has to be the exact two that uh, goes wrong or whatever. That could also be the case with the physical shit injures themselves or like an energy card here or there that becomes um, stuck at the bottom after your Brock. But um, reset stamp means that you have to just pass and like end up giving up a prize card like two turns later or something like that um, because you've not been able to go down to zero, then resource management back to three. Um, so as long as your opponent is playing reset stamp, they have that advantage against you and it's still worth them playing the game long against you because they can sometimes gain these free prizes throughout um, but it still is difficult, um, and it really is, has, it does have to be a deck you test a lot for worlds. Um, I've only just sort of started testing this deck, like, maybe 20 games or so, um, and I've played this archetype before, Unified Minds, never really profile the deck, because I find it very difficult to talk, like, about the deck whilst playing at the same time, because it would basically be me sat there in silence just thinking and clicking a lot, um, and I don't think that would be interesting content. And that really does show testament to how difficult the deck is to pilot properly. And although you have more room to make mistakes with this archetype now, uh, because you get gusted less, like previously four Guzma was in everything, so you had to not make a single mistake. Now you can make like a couple mistakes. Um, but those, there are like more pitfalls now. So you're more likely to make more mistakes with this deck. So it really is one you have to be proficient with if you expect to do well with it at Worlds. Um, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on the Shedinja archetype. What do you think of my list? Have you been trying anything else in the archetype? I'll hear it all down below. And also let me know if you're teching for Shedinja at Worlds. I think it'll be one of these decks that isn't that popular day one. Uh, but there will be people squeaking through with it if they are proficient. So I do think there is a lot of power behind the deck if played correctly. And if people can figure out the loop without just dying to reset stamp at the wrong time. So I'll hear it all down below in the discussion. And I'll be back tomorrow with another video. Thanks so much for watching.